This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Lebedew. Hey, this is episode four of the podcast. Welcome, welcome. Uh, in this show, Stelio Duraco's comments from his uh, interview uh, regarding the subject of um, being consistent as a coach in terms of your personality and how you interact with your players and how you basically present yourself uh, is kind of the main focus. If you don't know Stelio, uh, he's a Canadian in descent, uh, played for the Canadian national team and also played professionally in Europe. He went almost directly from being a player to being a coach in Italy. Uh, he's, uh, he was the men's national team coach for Australia during the 2000 Olympic cycle. Uh, he also coached the Canadian national team where they won a Norseka championship and competed in the World Cup. He, at the club level, has won uh, two European Cups with uh, Montecchiari in Italy and has also coached in Romania where he won, he's won a couple of leagues and a, a couple of cups as well. Uh, in these days, or at least at the time of, uh, of the interview, he has been working in Dubai. Uh, so enjoy. I think uh, this is an interesting discussion. What's the most important part of the coach's job, in your opinion? Uh, I'm thinking things like uh, uh, individual relationships, practice or training development, uh, the match itself, um, other other things. I, I think the mark to answer your question. I, I think it's to be consistent. To be consistent in the way that you are uh, on a daily basis, so that uh, when you walk into the court. Uh, People know that you're ready to work, and that you've got a, that you've got a that you've got a plan. You've got a you've got a purpose for for being there. When you speak to management, you're consistent in in the ways of talking about about your needs and the needs of of uh, of the team. So I think that it's that consistency factor that is there. If you're energetic, then you got to be energetic every day. If you're going to be a talker, then you got to be a talker every day. And, and I think that's the consistency with which you present yourself and what you do, to me, is, is, is very important. And when I, when, I, uh, when I don't, I feel myself sometimes when I, when I don't do that, I don't enjoy what I'm, what I'm doing. And so I try to be consistent all the time so that there is that enjoyment side of things as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a, an interesting answer. That wasn't the answer that I was... Uh, not that I was expecting it wasn't just a d different direction so I think that that makes it uh, makes it more interesting I I like the answer a lot well the thing is the thing is that you you know you you're you're also as as when you're involved in a club situation you're also given a directive by your by your owners mm -hmm. uh, we want to win we want to win we're going to present you with the two we're going I'm going to I'm going to open my wallet and I'm going to give you what you need in order to win. Mm -hmm. um, that's great, but how, you know, uh, how do we do it? Yeah. And I think it's that consistency. It's that consistency side of things that is also very, very important. That you uh, that you bring forward every single day yourself to be the best of yourself. Because then, uh, you know, people will follow you. Yeah. Um, if you are, if you are every day, sometimes, uh, even in my experience here in, in, uh, uh, in Dubai, um, I would go and shag balls. I would go and get balls. I would go and, you know, put the balls in the bat and my assistant coaches would come and say, coach, you must not do that. And I said, why? <laughs> the players are going to do it. I'm going to do it as well. So, I'm, so when you lead by example, mm -hmm. you will see then people are going to do that. Yeah. People, if you are one that just that just that just uh, uh, preaches but does not teach, mm -hmm. then you're going to lose. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. So it's, you're going to lose interest in people. So it's that consistency side of things yeah. that I think are important in, in the daily aspects of coaching. Stelio in his interview covered a lot of points and uh, and was a was a really good interview, but. The, the one that really jumped out to me as I was having the conversation was was this point of uh, consistency. And 
consistency in coaching is one thing that we talk about a lot we hear about it a lot and it's uh we talk about consistency of message we talk about consistency of feedback um we talk about consistency of demanding expectations of uh uh that the the expectations are the same every day but um once Delia started talking on the topic it, it was clear to me that what he was talking about was not consistency of those things but uh, consistency in uh, presentation for perhaps or consistency of mood and um, the way the coach came into practice uh, every day in a positive uh, state of mind to to work and to improve and uh, this it's not a uh something that that i've heard a lot about in coaching literature from a lot of coaches and um i think it's a it's an incredible point and it really resonated with me uh, from having worked with stelio as his assistant and um being in a situation uh in uh, in a league season where uh, the season was not very successful we had a slow start we didn't have a very strong team and um, for most of the season uh, we were in one of the bottom two relegation positions and um, to watch Stelio from close quarters come in to work every day um, just as positive as the day before however hideous the the loss was on the weekend and and the way that he he continued to be positive with the team with the individual players with the with the fans which is pretty important in that situation with the with clubs with with everyone and then uh, to see the effects as we we won six of the last 11 matches and 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 gave ourselves a chance to be uh, to keep our position in the league until the last day of the season uh, was for me was really incredible achievement and and uh, one of the reasons that I nominated him as a as a coaching wizard and did the interview with him was that it's not the the wins the the championships the titles that necessarily show the the quality of someone's coaching but um that was a, a great season of coaching uh where we ended up being relegated at the end of it but um for those reasons uh, that that statement uh, that consistency of of uh of presentation if you will uh, i thought was an incredible incredibly valuable point I actually had something, some uh, feedback myself. My first, uh, then actually it was my second season uh, coaching the college women, where one of the returning players from the year before actually asked me before or after training one day, just how come my my general mood was I don't know if it was more serious or or whatever, but it was less enthusiastic or less upbeat than it had been the season before. And it, it got me thinking about, you know, the players actually do pick up on these things. And, you know, I, I shouldn't be allowing whatever is causing me to be different emotionally, mentally, whatever, to be showing through in terms of when I'm coaching. Uh, to, to Stelio's point, you know, you turn up every day and the players know what to expect. Because if, if you're up and down, it's just like if you're in a relationship with, with somebody else, you know, it's your manager at work or whatever. If you turn up every day and you're not sure which version of them you're going to have, you're going to get for that day, it's, it's pretty stressful. Uh, I've, I've had managers like that myself where you just don't know. So I, can, I could appreciate, you know, when these players were asking me these questions and trying to get at what was going on, and, and it definitely influenced my coaching. You know, I, I, I worked on becoming – much more consistent from that perspective. The question, though, is how you do it. So how do you how do you go from potentially being a little bit more uneven to trying to be that stable, calm, whatever uh, personality? It's 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 the same guy turns up to the gym every single day. Same person addresses the media, addresses the the, the fans, the supporters, management, even. 
especially when you may be a person who tends toward being emotionally invested anyway. That's that's a great question. <laughs> that's uh, that's life coaching. I think we're we're edging onto there. And I, the first thing when you say that, it comes into my head is is one of those uh, internet memes that that pops up every now and again. I forget where it's from, but the most important decision you make every day is your mood. And I'm a strong believer that uh, obviously there are exceptions to this, but I'm a strong believer that you have a great deal of control over your mood. You can choose to be in a good mood or a bad mood. And uh, as a coach, you really have to choose to be in a good mood or a positive mood um, every day. And there are situations where where I've, I've done the, the opposite, um, where you want to give a message to the group that something's not acceptable or whatever, where uh, or that some action of the group wasn't appropriate, uh, it, you also have to uh, choose that mood as well sometimes. And uh, I've, I've, in my younger days, I actually did the experiment of changing my mood from day to day to see how the, the team reacted. And, and it's incredible the, the way that it works. If, if you come into the gym uh, joking and smiling or if you come into the gym sullen and withdrawn, uh, the practice that follows reflects the uh, ref reflects exactly that mood and um, the answer to your question I think is really simply uh, you have to choose to be in that mood yeah as you were saying that I couldn't help but think of, of one of your favorite points to make about you you see what you expect to see and so if you go into training in a somber mood and you and training and you feel like training has been reflective of a somber mood, is it actually you just picking up on what you saw? And if the players were perfectly happy, they were fine. <laughs> it was just you. Uh, which, I mean, may or not, it kind of goes around the point. But it, 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 it speaks to a broader point of the, the mood that we bring into training is going to color what we see in training. If, we, if we're happy and you know, we come into training, we're, we may tend to focus on the positive things. Whereas if we're kind of down or, or, or upset about something, then we may tend to focus on the negative things more than we focus on the positives. So are you suggesting this is a chicken or the egg conversation? <laughs> that the mood of the coach doesn't influence, doesn't influence the team, but it influences the way uh, we assess the practice? I think, the, I think well, I think there's, there's both sides of it. I think from the individual coach's perspective, it's certainly going to color the impression that they have of how tra training is going. I mean, if, if you're already feeling angry about something, even if it has nothing to do with volleyball or the team or whatever, and something happens in training that you don't necessarily care for, it's probably more likely to set you off than if you came into training on a happy mood, given the exact same situation. Now, the other side of that is, okay, do the players respond to you differently based on your own mood? And you have to, you have to figure that they do. I mean, I, I, don't, I think it's hard not to expect them to, to react to how you're presenting yourself from day to day. This leads into a, a discussion about uh, mood in general and how it influences your work and... Um, one one thing that you'll find that you see in a lot of gyms uh, is that the coach will yell at two or three guys, and most often it's the it's the youngest guys. And uh, I'm as a coach, I've always been aware of that. And the reason that the coach yells at the youngest guys is nearly always because they're the easiest guys to yell at, and the the anger is not directed or dissatisfaction, although mostly it's anger, even if it shouldn't be. The dissatisfaction is actually with the performance of somebody else and the younger player is the outlet for that dissatisfaction. And I think 
one important coaching quality is to be able to differentiate the difference between those two things. If I'm angry with John and I don't want to shout at John for whatever reason because he's my star player I, and he's a little bit sensitive, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to upset him, then I have to suck it up and hold that within and not uh, scream at Jim because just because I'm mad at John. And uh, I think that uh, that's another it's another part of Stelio's uh, another part of Stelio's point. Uh, if I'm upset at the results, if I'm if I had a fight with my wife, if the president just uh, had a conversation with me that I didn't like, um, all of those things, I have to compartmentalize my uh, my feelings that I don't take them out on something else. And uh, I think that that goes that speaks to the broader point of um, of mood and and the ability, coach's ability to control that. Yeah, I was, I was I can't help but think about um, several times, probably many more than several times, where you know during the course of a day, for whatever reason, I just got into my head that I wasn't really all that excited about having to do training that night. Uh, it could have been because of my workload during the day. It could have been some because something happened. It was just one of those situations where it's like, ah, you know, I wish I could just kind of chill out and not have to be in the gym. But invariably, once I got to the gym, my whole mood would change. You know, I, I was in my you know happy place or whatever you want to call it, and I would walk out of that that session or those those sessions because I, I when I was coaching in Exeter, I was usually doing back to back. And while, you know, I might be tired and stiff and, you know, physically abused for whatever, you know, for, from having to do whatever I had to do, I was mm -hmm. mentally in a much better state than I had been at the beginning. Um, and it's, it's something that I know I've seen a lot of coaches do, and I've, I've said it to myself, where we tell our players that they should leave all that, uh, that other stuff outside the door when they walk into the gym or walk into the locker room or whatever the case may be. And so they can just focus on the volleyball and not worry about the boyfriend, girlfriend, and not worry about if they're a student, you know, the, the test they took that day or the test they have to take tomorrow or, you know, or just life in general. Um, and, you know, the advice from Stelio seems to be we need to take our own advice that we give our players and make sure we're applying it to ourselves. Um, and in my case, it's, it's always seemed to be when I do that, when I can, when I can kind of just leave that all at the door, ends up making things, not just volleyball things, but a lot of things, much more enjoyable. Um, I agree 100%. <laughs> All right, well, let me ask you this, because this is something that, that has come up with in your own interview a little bit, and I think in, in other discussions as well, is this ties into a coach's emotional state during a match. Um, you know, some coaches are more animated than others, to, to, mm -hmm. you know, to say the least. Uh, Jefferson Williams talked about how when he started coaching, um, there was at the time where coaches had to sit on the bench. They weren't allowed to stand up and walk around. And yep. he, he, <laughs> he was basically accused of, you know, practically being vertical. Sorry, horizontal. Yeah, horizontal. On the bench because yeah. he was just so so chilled out. But then once things once the rules changed and he was allowed to walk around, he, he became much more uh, agitated is probably a strong word, but much more physically and emotionally connected to what was going on on the court. Mm -hmm. So you've said that you coach, you think you coach a little bit better when there's a bit more emotion involved. Um, talk about that a little bit. I began coaching in the same era that Jefferson coached. So um, we had to sit on the bench. And um, when I started, there was allowed to be interaction between the coach and the team during the match. Earlier, there was not, coach was not allowed to speak, was not allowed to say anything to the, to the court. And it was really difficult for me because when I began, I was a very... Uh, uh, emotional coach in practice and there was a lot of screaming and yelling and I'm 
uh, I'm appalled in retrospect to say abuse and um, it took me a lot of effort to be able to sit on the bench and to present a calm exterior to not jump around um, my my personal opinion is that the the team works better when the coach is in control or when um, sorry maybe uh, maybe I need to turn that around a different different way the team needs to feel that the coach has some kind of control over uh, the situation the coach has the solutions um, if need be and my personal opinion is if the coach is jumping up and down and running around and screaming and yelling at everybody then this is not the um, this doesn't give that sense of calm, that sense of trust uh, to the team. I know that others disagree with that. I know that I've heard in in in, uh, in other contexts that players like that the um, that the coach is involved and and things like that. But but that's not my my strongest feeling. Um, so. But to achieve that level of calm takes a fair bit of uh, self-discipline and uh, and forcing yourself not to um, not, not not to jump up and down when every fibre of your being wants to. Uh, that leads to a kind of introspective, thoughtful, um, uh, working way of uh, way of approaching the game. Because if you're if you're controlling your emotions you you by definition become more thoughtful and and reading uh, I forget the author now but the, the book is how we decide they they talked about different kinds of decisions being uh, better taken by different parts of your brain so some some decisions are better emotional decisions some better some decisions are better uh, taken logically and uh, on that basis, I, I thought about a, a game, and and a game is uh, there's a lot of feeling and emotion involved. And if you make it a completely uh, logical um, process, then uh, perhaps you can lose something. And the the simple the simple uh, uh, the simple example is taking time out. So um, should I take a time out now? And you can come up with seven. Uh, positive and, and negative reasons why you should or shouldn't take a time out at exactly this moment. And of course, uh, a, a time out is, is partly uh, response to the emotional happenings in the court and B, um, if you go through seven points, you've lost the moment. The next rally's already started. So uh, I started thinking about uh, allowing more emotion during the game um, to tap into that decision-making process, that emotional decision-making process. And I found that if I allowed myself a little bit more emotion and it gave me a better connection to the game because the game is not just uh, X's and O's. It's, uh, uh, it's 15, 25 people uh, interacting with each other, more if you count the crowd. and. And uh, so that's that's the background of that, and and uh, I think that tapping into that does allow for, in that context, better, some better decisions. Okay, I I think back in terms of my own progression, and you talked about when you were had to be sitting on the bench, um, you were constantly fighting the, the desire to jump up and, and be animated. And I actually remember my first couple of years coaching at Brown, I was the assistant coach, and at that point, you know, the assistant coaches really didn't get up. It was, if anybody was going to get up, it was the head coach. Um, mm -hmm. And I would invariably, from the, from the act of bottling up whatever was in there, would end up with my, my face would just be completely red at the end of a match. I mean, just bright, bright mm -hmm. red. And... Yeah. I mean, to the point where people, you know, the head coach would comment on it. And at a certain point, I made the decision to stand down with the team at the mm -hmm. end of the bench. 
rather than sit. And it made a massive difference because not that I became any more animated or anything like that. I wasn't, you know, I was still the assistant coach, so I still wasn't in the position of, of being the one who was going to, you know, scream or yell at the team or anything like that. But just being able to pace around a little bit seemed to bleed out a lot of, a lot of that energy that was bottling up. And the head coach at the time, she, she made the comments, she's like, you're, you're much less red now than you used to be when you were sitting on the bench. And I still mm -hmm. feel it when I'm a head coach now, just that little bit of pacing back and forth just tends to be a calming effect for me. And now, this is obviously opposite to what Jefferson experienced, um, where mm -hmm. he became more animated. But I also think uh, at some stage I learned to disconnect emotionally from the results. Um, <laughs> and, well, you know, the results are, are not in your control. You know, they're, they're almost completely outside of your control once the whistle blows. You know, our, our job as coaches is primarily in, in the gym, in the training phase. You know, right. yes, there are, there's, yes, there are things that we do on match day that influence the outcome. Um, some some are greater or less, yeah, yeah, some greater or less than others. But some of our interviews will take the different uh, different tack on that. Yep, yeah, yeah, we've we've had discussions on trainers versus coaches and, and what the difference is, and mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll get into that in another episode. Um, but for me, it just became, and maybe this is a reflection of me having more of an educational, developmental perspective on things, and less being really focused on the winning and losing and, and the competitive side. But I, I found that from a from a, a coaching health perspective, mental well-being perspective, I was definitely much better off focusing on the process side of things and, okay, in this given situation, what am I seeing? What can we do better? What can what can what are we doing well? Uh, almost not completely because I'm still in the moment as a coach and trying to look at you know how how can we we win this match or win this set or whatever, but also kind of filing away all those things that need to be worked on <laughs> in the training sessions to come. And I did find that that helped because especially in those years when I was a young coach. Still, with a little bit of that player mentality, there was there was always that urge to jump up and do it. You know, you're kind of sitting there fidgeting the whole time, making the plays yourself. Yeah, I think uh, we should make the point that the option of the assistant coach standing in the corner with the team is not one that's uh, available under international rules. That's a right a specific NCAA rule. So. Um, uh, European coaches uh, need to find a different solution to that problem, but the, it's an interesting point you raise about emotionally separating yourself from the result because another thing that, that's come up quite a few times over the years is is uh, an, at some moment in the game uh, when I accept the possibility of defeat so there's a you say okay wait we can lose this game and or we have already lost this game maybe uh, something along those lines that does also uh, pre provided a, or has to me anyway provided an emotional release that let me focus on the game in a different way and uh, uh, and to work in a different way so uh, I I can come up with examples of situations where I made better decisions after having that mental process in my mind, that uh, uh, release from the release from the result. Yeah, I can actually think of a time when I was coaching the Exeter men in a match that nobody thought we were going to win, and we didn't think we were going to win um, in final eights, and the whole the whole match long, you know, I'm coaching with the expectation that when the final whistle blows, we will have lost the match. Mm -hmm. and, and even we lost the first set, and this is, this is in tournament style, so it was best two or three. We lost the first mm -hmm. set. We were down quite a bit early in the second set, and you know, it wasn't looking real good. And then you know, somebody made a good play and kind of turned the momentum around, we ended up winning the second set. And we're in the third set, and, and we're up, you know, like 12-10 or 13-10 or something like that. And I, I remember still thinking to myself, well, we're probably going to lose, but 
<laughs> this is this is what I need to do. You know, if, you know, if I'm, if we're playing to win here, you know, call them mm-hmm. the timeout or make the sub or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, there is there is a certain freedom to having already kind of allowed yourself to the realization that it's pro- it may not work in your favor, but mm-hmm. you know, we're gonna keep doing it. All right, we're uh, we're winding down on time. Any final thoughts? Um, no, I think it's just a really interesting point from from Stelia, and and the broader point is uh, how your mood, how your emotions uh, affect you, but also in this context, how they affect others. And um, if you want a team to be positive, hardworking. Uh, focused on improvement, um, then you, the coach, has to make that decision on your mood uh, every day and come into the gym with that mindset. Because if the if the coach doesn't have that mindset, then you can't expect the players to have it. Right. Okay. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com